you have your Bibles, if you could open up to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, and we're going to start at the end of chapter 5 and make our way through most of chapter 6. <clears throat> and the Hebrew writer, we don't know uh, who he is. Uh, it's not disclosed. There's some speculation uh, who it may be. Um, but it's just a beautiful book. Uh, very deep, very meaty. Uh, it's, it's a great book. If you haven't, I'd encourage you to read through it. But in this book, the author is trying, he makes the point, and you're familiar with this, the church crowd, this notion, this instruction, that we can't stay on the milk. Uh, there's a time for that. There's a time for the foundations, and then there is a time to get on to the meat of the word, and it is essential that this happens. So he discusses that. He discusses the importance of building upon the salvation that we have. And, and I think it's especially needed in today's world because we have a lot of Christians. If you survey, they see a lot of people that believe in Jesus and such, a lot of people that say they're Christians. But folks, we really, really, really need mature Christians. We need the Christians that we have to mature. And the way to do that is by getting deeper and understanding and learning the meat of the Word all the meats that's there. The author also reminds us that the Lord is seeing the efforts that we are giving to serving his kingdom. And it's an encouraging word. So that's kind of like an introduction. But if we could go ahead and start with uh, Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> and I'm going to start in verse 11. Again, it's going to sound familiar to a lot of us. Uh, concerning him... Uh, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Ah, uh, that's not good. That's not good. Dull of hearing. You're there, but you're not really paying attention. You're doing your devotion, but you're not really getting it. You're putting the time in, you're going through the motions, but there's so much else that has you occupied that you're, the hearing is dull. You just can't... I find that my hearing is getting dull, literally. I'm always like, what'd you say? What? Um, it's ridiculous. People having to repeat themselves. But in a spiritual sense, you're not sharp. It's just kind of in one ear, out the other. No change, no response, nothing. And he is saying, he is telling the people they become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. He's saying, if you're dull of hearing, if you're just on the milk, if you've not gone beyond the basic, beyond the basic principles of Christianity, you cannot discern what is right and what is wrong. Doesn't that sound like that could be a problem with the American church and with America in general? We don't know what's right and wrong anymore. The Christians don't. We're not able to discern that because we can't get past, well, God loves you. Uh, except Jesus shall go to heaven, and he's the judge of eternity, and that's it. We've gone no further than that. So when it comes to these other elementary principles in Christianity, we don't know them, we're not listening for them, we're not being taught them, therefore we can't even discern what's going on around us. I'm telling you folks, that is a big reason why America and the church in America is in the pickle that we are in, and it is not a, good, not a good thing. If we were able to discern uh, by eating the meat of God, things would be more clear. Raising our children, and who we hang out with, and picking a spouse, and who to vote for, for crying out loud. <clears throat> but people are so muddled, they just don't know, and we're making so many bad decisions 
And the author of Hebrews is saying the problem is you're not even gone beyond these, beyond these fundamentals. You need to get into the Word of God and understand it more. We would have a better idea of understanding creation, climate changes, and at least understanding what's being proposed to us. Um, medicine, vaccine mandates, all of these things as we get a deeper understanding. Now you may say, well, Scott, you're not going to find something in the Bible that says whether or not you should get a vaccine. But there is things in the scripture that gives you a better understanding. When you look at creation, what God has for us, when you look at the things that are ultimately going to be harmful to our world, a lot of it doesn't have to do with the sky falling in. It has to do with the hearts of man and their sinfulness. That's our biggest problem. But we get an understanding that helps us to make these big decisions. I think if we want to try to grow, if we want to get into the meat of the Word, first of all, we've got to make sure we're reading the Bible. Okay, We've got to get in. We've got to read. We've got to study. It's imperative, and we put it off so much. I put it off so much. It is so crucial to get a better understanding of the God that we serve by being in His Word, Old Testament and New Testament. That will help us get into the meat of the Word. Um, attending a Bible-centered church, and folks, I can promise you we have one here. Uh, Pastor Roger, the other teachers, there is a heart and a hunger for God, not just for simple things, but to really kind of get in and to delve in. Um, read good books. I'm telling you, folks, you, you pick up a C.S. Lewis book, and there are many other authors, you're, you're going to be blessed by it. Uh, there are people that God has inspired and taught them, and, and, you, and they could teach you and show you and help you to grow in Christ. Uh, very good. There's some bad ones too, but there's a lot of good stuff out there, just from brothers and sisters that have, 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 uh, have written. So all these ways we can learn and get into more of the Word of God, getting into that meat. Um, and if you're already doing these things, I would encourage you, don't give up. Don't give up. Because all the nonsense from the world around you is bombarding you. All these different theories and thoughts and the way things are and the way the world works. You've got to stay true to what you know. The Lord has revealed these things to you and it is special. And you've got to live our lives accordingly. So just be careful. You don't want to be swayed otherwise. Those of you who already have that understanding that is intended for us to have by the Lord. All right, now into... Chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of instruction about washings or, or baptism, and laying on of the hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. So he's saying, you're teaching people, you can't just keep going over these basics. These are great. You have to have those. Any Christian needs to understand these, but you just can't rely on those and that's it. If you do that, it is like you have gone and you've cut out a foundation, you've got your footer, you've got it on bedrock, you've got your chief cornerstone, you've laid your block, and you have prepared a wonderful foundation for your home. And that is wonderful, unless you have to use the bathroom. Got the foundation, where's the toilet? Well, I never got that far. Well, let's make some supper. Don't have my kitchen. Got the foundation, though. You've got to build upon that, folks. I do, too. We've got to build upon that in order to have something to present, something to house, something to be effective. And that's what he's saying. Don't just keep going over the, founda the foundations over and over again. Build upon them. Good foundations, great foundations, but you've got to build upon them. Verse 3, it says, And this we will do if God permits. That's interesting. So you're telling me we've got to go and build upon these fundamentals, but you're saying if God permits. Does he want me to build on the, per on the foundation or doesn't he? What he's saying, God will determine when that time is. There is a time for milk. And there is a time for a hamburger. God knows when that is. So if he permits, when the time is ready, when he feels you're ready to accept it, then you're going to start hearing it. Don't think for a minute that your pastor or 
preachers, good preachers, teachers, that is not coming from the word, not coming from God. He is instructing. I know everybody I know here and in many churches, they're looking and listening to the uh, to God, to His voice, to His direction. We don't want to say something that we want to say. We want it to come from Him. And He is faithful to direct that message for when you're ready to hear it. It's not just pulled out of some, uh, you know, oh, just, just haphazardly picking out something to share. There's time that is spent. We want God's direction. So when you're ready, if God permits, that word will come and you need to receive it. And I need to receive it. Amen? Verse number four. For in the case of those who have been, and this is a tricky one, so hang, hang on with this one. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify themselves, the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. Woo! Now, how many, you, we've heard that, right? Um, very sobering. No doubt about it, that is a very sobering verse. My concern is that many of us have heard heard that, and in the midst of your backsliding, the midst of your poor performance as a Christian, the midst of your neglecting God for a season, maybe a short season, a long season, you hear this and you think, well, that's it. I did serve God. I partook in all these things. I knew of his glory. I understand his plan. I, I got all that, and I just slipped away from it or walked away from it intentionally. And sometimes we hear that, and sometimes even preachers will say, this is like a damnation. Well, you're done. And we've, we've got to be careful there. Um, it, it is true, the Lord desires growth from us, and he wants us to be faithful. But this is not for the person that is backslidden. This is not for the person who's made some bad decisions. Maybe you're struggling in some kind of sin. We know of the Lord's patience. We know of his long-suffering. If you're in that position, there is, I would definitely say, yes, get before the Lord and he is long-suffering and he will take us back. So we don't want to read this and having screwed up and just say, well, we're done, forget about it. Even though these are very stark words and is the word of God. But even if we look at, let's say the prodigal son, for example. Here we have this wonderful parable that's taught by the Lord himself. And it demonstrates this guy, he lived in the father's house. He knew all the benefits. He reaped the benefits. He ate the food. He wore the clothes. He walked around the mansion. He tended the land. Everything that was part of the father's house, he enjoyed it. He walked away, didn't he? Just walked away from it. Now, nope, I want something else. You just give me the money. I'm out of here. And of course, at some point, he has some spiritual revelation to go back to the father, doesn't he? No. The friends are gone. The money runs out. The food is gone. He's in a desperate spot. Then... He finally decides to return. But my point is, he did the same thing, but yet the father welcomed him with open arms, ran out to meet him. So when we hear this teaching, we have to be careful. What the author is saying, he's saying, okay, you keep going over these basic fundamental teachings. Uh, if you're doing that because you think that there is someone in the congregation that has fallen away and they need to come back, so you need to keep going it over again. The writer's saying you, you can't do that. If people have made a deliberate uh, choice to walk away and stay away and their heart is hardened, you can't keep preaching the same sermon to try to win them back in. And I think a lot of times we do it in the modern church today. I had friends of mine that live out in Smith County and they were attending a church for several months, several months. Every Sunday, they covered the salvation marriage <laughs> message. They covered judgment, eternal life. They went over the same thing. And they're like, I'm not getting anything. It's great for someone that's just visiting or maybe someone that's backslidden and just came back to work, but the body isn't being built up. They're not being encouraged. They left that church, and I think they needed to. 
So what he's saying is you, you've, got to, you've got to take the people of God and you've got to allow them to grow and not just going over the same thing all the time. We're, we're very um, sensitive with evangelism and we want to do that. We want to evangelize. We want to spread the word of God. But the people of the body of Christ, they've got to be built up. They've got to hear the deeper things of God in order to, open, in order to grow. All right, verse number seven. <clears throat> For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it, and brings forth vegetation useful to those whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. In other words, the rain comes, it's tilled, they produce a good fruit, other people are benefit, the Lord will bless that. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. That theme is very consistent throughout the Scripture. Um, in the Old Testament, um, even in the book of Amos, uh, he instructs the prophet. The prophet goes and he speaks judgment against all these surrounding nations around the nation of Israel, who he was speaking to at the time. And he tells him and he tells the people, he said, yes, these people are going to be punished, but you, Israel, you're really going to get it. Because it's you that I've poured my knowledge into. I have taught you and revealed myself. I've watered you and tilled you up. And instead of producing a fruit and being an example to those surrounding nations, which would have helped them in their salvation, you're just as bad as they are. So the judgment is extra hard. We have the story of the fig tree. The Lord is, on, he is passing by the second time. He sees this fig tree. There's no frig, figs on it. He curses it. You know, well, that sounds harsh. No, this thing has been there. It's been watered. It's been fertilized. It's growing. It's got leaves. It looks good, but there's no fruit. If there's no fruit, the Lord is saying that that situation, that person is, is going to be judged. Okay? So that is very consistent. You, you, it's not just get salvation and sit on it. There's always something more. The Lord wants us to grow and be a blessing and a help to others. Very consistent in this passage and all the scripture. But to say that you're going to get to a point and where that point is that you're done, uh, that's between you and the Lord. I think it can happen. I believe it can happen. Uh, you know, sometimes our heart is so cold that the Lord just says, that's it. And I think that's consistent with scripture as well. But when you're at that point, who, who, who knows? And I would never tell anybody that, oh yeah, you're, you're, you're right. You've gone too far. You're done. Uh-uh, that's for the Lord to determine. I hope that makes sense. All right, verse number nine. But, beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation. Things that go along with salvation. Things that come after salvation. Though we are speaking to you in this way. So he said, he knows that there's going to be better things coming, even though I'm rough on you guys. Wait a minute, you just said all this stuff about being burned and we only want milk and we're like big babies. Oh, now you're going to tell us that you think that there's some, there's some hope for us. But he points out, he says, even though I'm hard on you, even though I spoke like this, I know, I know there's something in you guys. The Lord has something for you and he's going to build on this foundation. Now, I'll tell you, folks, it's, it's, hard. it's hard to hear correction. It just is. I, I've been in church now for a long time. I've been on church boards at different places and, and leadership kind of positions. So I've been in spots where I've had to take correction. I hate it. Absolutely hate it. You're telling me I'm wrong. i got to do something. I just don't like it. But I've had it, and I've had Sometimes I turned away from it. Not a good idea. And it comes from, from pastors, from friends, from employers, wives, <laughs> they're, they're like really good at it, really good at it. Uh, it's hard to take, and it is extremely uncomfortable to have to dish it out, too. It's not fun. Uh, you guys, uh, you know, military guys, bosses, people that are in church, it's hard to tell people, and it's hard to do it in church, too. And I, I've had the uh, the, the, the misfortune of having to do that throughout my lifetime. Say, hey, brother, you're kind of you're out of line here. This really needs to stop. 
And, um, and usually you could tell before you even speak to those people if they're going to receive it or not. And some people, I, and, I, and I love to hear it, I love to see people where if they've been corrected by the church, they stop whatever's going on and they stay. That is a sign of spiritual maturity, big time. Love to see it. But then there's some people where I know they're not going to receive it. I just know, and I know they're going to leave, and that's exactly what happens. It depends. Are you, are you willing? Do you want to be part of the body? Do you want to serve Christ the right way? Or are you just in the church for your own purpose? There's a big difference. And you got to watch, uh, watch for those folks that are trying to stir things up. But he says, I spoke to you harshly, but I believe in you. I know there are better things coming. Verse number 10. <clears throat> for God is not unjust as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. Um, God is not unjust, period. He is not unjust in that regard. Where you're working, you're serving, you're doing everything you can, you're helping this one, you're sharing the word with that one, you're being faithful over here, and that he doesn't see it. Now, that is not the case uh, in our lives. It just isn't. How many people think that your boss has acknowledged and appreciated everything that you've done for the company or on the job? It, it does happen, but a lot of times it doesn't. It just doesn't, and it's frustrating. Um, probably the most unappreciative group, or unappreciated group, I should say, in the world would be, anyone want to take a guess? who does the most and doesn't get appreciated for it nearly the way that they should. Moms, that's it, you know. It's the moms. You guys, my gosh. You labor, you, you cook, you work, you clean diapers, you give advice, you hug, you kiss, you instruct, you spank, all these things. And the kids, eh, some of them do sometimes, but overall, it's a thankless job. It's tough. It is really tough. Um, and even as dads, same kind of thing. They, they just, you don't, you don't get appreciated. Often the parents don't appreciate what the children done. It's just the way it is. It's sad. It ought not to be, but that's the way it is. But in the Lord is saying, I see what you're doing. I know what you're doing. I see it. And I love you. And there is blessing for that. It's not going unnoticed. It may go unnoticed by the pastor, or maybe some of the people in the congregation, maybe the people on the job, the people on the street, but he knows and he sees. That is so important for us to hold on to. He doesn't come in person and tell us, but he sees in everything he knows what we're doing. So hang in there. Keep treating the kids well. Keep sharing with your friends. Keep being a good boss, a good employer. Everything you're doing, keep it up. Okay, I think we're on verse number 11. <clears throat> and we desire that each of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. He wants us to come into that realization, to totally grasp, and to have that assurance from this world, you don't get assurance. There's no promises. You might get insurance, but that's different and expensive. Um, but that assurance that everything's going to be okay, you can't conjure that up from the world. <laughs> you can't. Are they going to get it from Biden? Uh, you know, I, I mean, come on. You're going to get it from, really, truly, as much as they love you and care, care for you, you're going to get it from mom and dad? You're going to get it from your girlfriend, your husband, uh-uh. But Christ gives us that because of the hope. We have that hope because we understand who he is, what he does, what he has for us. And there is an assurance that comes along with that hope. Where is it, Scott? You can't put your finger on it, but it's, it's a promise that has been given to us. And that assurance has got to come from there because if it's coming from anywhere else, it's not going to hold up anyway. 
But he wants us to walk and to live in that assurance, that full assurance of hope until the end. Not just halfway through, not just until you're 17, or like Irv, 104, but all the way to the end, the end of your life, the end of the age. All the way, he is there. He is there for us. Um, okay, so he says, the full assurance of hope until the end, verse 12, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promise. Not sluggish. I'm sluggish. I like to nap. I'm not a high energy kind of guy. I know you high energy people. I see you out there. I'm not one of them. Uh, you know, the metabolism's all kicked up. You can't sit still. I don't have that problem. Uh, I wish I did. But, um, don't be sluggish. Don't be lax in th the things of God. Be diligent. Serve him well. Um, and it says, imitators of those who faith and patience inherit the promise. Imitate. You know, when we read about all these faithful people in the script scriptures, imitate them. Uh, the people around you, even at this church, there are people that are worth watching and observing and doing what they do. They're great examples. Throughout the history of the world, my goodness, there are tons of pastors, missionaries, just regular, regular people that have done wonderful things. Watch how they live and learn it and imitate it. The people of faith, and that will help us to grow. So, in closing, I'd like to remind you again, if you are a meat eater, to the carnivores out there, keep eating, keep growing. Don't fall back to principles. Keep growing. I mean, you, you know, we are studying and learning about a God that is so vast and incomprehensible. And it's true, there are some mysteries, even came up in Sunday school today, there are some mysteries of God we're just not going to get. That, that's fair. But boy, there are a lot of them that we need to seek and find out and just revel and enjoy finding out who he is.